Mr. Douglas, you say that the word of God cannot be changed, and I believe that God will preserve his word. So how do you explain the many deletions and changes that have been made in the Bible? For example, verses from the book of Levit Leviticus commanding the people not to eat swine flesh, deleted. Quran can be proven to be its original form as it was revealed. What is the proof that the Bible is still whole and unchanged? Well, as Dr. Didat has said, this is a subject for a whole evening's discussion. In terms of uh, the proof that the Bible is still whole and unchanged, the, the evidence is in the great multitude of manuscripts of varying ages, many of them quite ancient, derived from a variety of different settings or countries, taking these, putting them as it were side by side, looking, seeing, comparing. Obviously there are uh, portions of the Bible where people have questions. You refer to Leviticus. I'm surprised you didn't look at the first part of John 8 or the end of Mark 16, where in various translations in English you will find those footnoted, saying that these materials are not found in some ancient manuscripts. It's a case of bringing all this together and looking at what is there and, and comparing one against the other in terms of of age and origin. It's out of that kind of a very upfront, very forthright sort of comparison from a human perspective. And even if you take all of those things away, in effect, in terms of the teaching of the Bible, you've lost absolutely nothing. Uh, the Old Testament obviously forbids the Jew to eat pork. And so I'm not quite sure what you're referring to there. I mean, the prohibition is there. Whether the particular verse you have in mind out of Leviticus uh, is something else or not. I'm simply saying it's a case of, of dealing with the things from a, a scholarly and a historical perspective. Beyond that, there is the whole question of God. Does God preserve and protect his word? Either he does or he doesn't. Now, preserve and protect his word can mean, in terms of meaning, in terms of what God has said that he wants people to do, or down to counting every I and every A and every E, which is a different thing, which has nothing to do with what the Bible teaches as such. Mr. Didat, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, or any of the others so raised, were they spiritualized? Paul spoke of the resurrection at the end of time. You see, the difference between resurrection and resuscitation is obvious. If Lazarus was resurrected, in that case, he would still be walking this earth. He might have been here with us. Because as the scripture tells us that no man can die twice. So where is he now? If he was resurrected, either he's spiritualized and gone up to heaven, but that didn't appear to the Jews. So he walked among the people and he lived among the people and he went back home and he ate food. So it must have been a resuscitation, not a resurrection in the sense that only once you are resurrected and after that, the judgment. I hope that answers that question. To Mr. Douglas, why or what is the difference of the Old and New Testament? 
shouldn't it just be one like the Quran? It is one like the Quran. The Old Testament is the Word of God given in part through Moses to the Jewish people, setting forth a multitude of ordinances and provisions for their lives, pointing on beyond to the coming of the Messiah. But to, to assume that the Old Testament and the New Testament somehow are at cross purposes or that they are different, they are different in some of the, in some of the uh, legal provisions because of the nature of God's dealing with Israel of old as opposed to God's dealing with all of humankind through Jesus. But they are one in that they are both from God that they both record the acts of God and hence the revelation of God's own nature leading to the greatest act of God's revelation in the person of Jesus and in his death and in his resurrection. Um, may I simply say, it's off the subject and I guess maybe we're not supposed to do this with these times, but uh, you're right, Mr. Didot, death has many things, many kinds of meaning, but the Gospels say they killed Jesus. That's very clear. Um, dear Brother Ahmed Didot, please clear the misunderstanding for the Christians about Jesus as never being crucified nor killed on the cross, but the situation looked like Jesus was there. The doctor made it appear, you know, as he was accusing me of reading into the scripture, uh, not seeing that he's doing, he had been doing the very same thing. Worse, you see, he says from the Holy Quran that the Quran says there's no illatibazan, that they are following conjecture. You see, fiction. But it says, now it appeared to them, so shubbiha lahum. Now shubbiha doesn't mean that somebody was substituted. The doctor says somebody was substituted. The Quran says, now Quran doesn't say anything to that effect. I don't know whether the uh, doctor knows Arabic. I'm sure he does. The amount of time he spent in the Middle East. And if you can show from the Quran that this word shubbiha lahum means substitution, it would be something. Interpretations of people is quite a thing apart. We are talking about books. When I'm referring from the Bible, I said, look, your book says a spirit has no flesh and bones. Do you understand that English? A spirit has no flesh and bones. If I were to tell you that because I got flesh and bones, I'm not a spirit, I'm not a ghost, I'm not a spook. I said, is that what it means in your language, you Englishman? Is that what it means in your language? And he says, yes. If I got flesh and bones, then I'm not the other thing. I asked the same question to the Zulu in his language. I said, is this what it means in your language? And he agrees. And every language group on earth, when you say the spirit has no flesh and bones, it means what it says. Now you have to tell me that, look, in my language, when a man says the spirit has no flesh and bones, it means a spirit has flesh and bones. Sometimes we English people, we speak in opposites. See, and we mean the same thing. When we say, when we say, uh, Slow down, we mean also slow up. You know, one father says, slow up, slow up, man, you know, you're too fast. The other says, look, he's telling you, why don't you slow down? Why don't you slow down? He says, slow down, slow up means the same thing. When we say in English, look out, we don't mean look out, we mean look in. So what are you talking about? What are you talking about? Said so a Frenchman was trying to learn English. Sitting in a skyscraper building, tall building, sitting by the window, and he hears somebody shouting, Look out! And he looks out, and a brick grazed him on the head. <laughs> he said, What's this? You know, what kind of language is this? He tells me to look out, and I look out. He says, No, when we say look out, means you look in, you don't look out. <laughs> doctor, doctor, sahib, 
I says, please tell us, tell these people that in my language, in English, when we say a spirit has no flesh and bones, that it has flesh and bones. Tell them so. Dr. Douglas, we hear from time to time that the Bible is being changed by some of your scholars, which results of having different versions. Which version do you suggest to be the best? If you think that the Bible is not changed, please refer this question to Mr. Didat. You're ready for this. Oh, yeah. oh. I want to be sure he's ready for this. But... All right. All right. <laughs> I will refer this to him because he, he obviously feels the Bible is changed. And so uh, um, we'll want to speak to this. I think the Bible is, uh, is not changed. Uh, the, question, uh, the question is... Um, which version do you suggest to be the best? Well, now you recognize when you're talking about a version, you're talking about a translation into English, into German, into French, into Arabic. And I suggest that the version is best that most accurately represents what the Greek text of the New Testament says. Like I would say to you, what version of the Quran is best? Is it Sales? Is it Pickthalls? Is it Arterberries? Do you know these translations? Do you know these versions? Some of you do. Which one is the best? Well, you would probably say none of those. The one, the one that has the English and the Arabic parallel one with another. And I would be glad to submit to any of you, if I could stay here two or three days, that we'd get half a dozen, we'd pick any text you want, and we would see the difference in the translations into English. And so which version of the Quran is best? The one that most faithfully reflects the Arabic, if you cannot read Arabic. Which version of the Bible is best? The one that most faithfully reflects the Greek of the Bible. And so, in effect, I'd say to you, this one's best. Right here. Right here. Why do I say this? Because this is a compilation of the best of all the ancient manuscripts. And if there are any questions about what the text says, they're right down at the bottom. They're not burned up, hidden away, destroyed, denied, lost, or whatever else. They're right there for you to look at and to ask, what difference do these differences make? And in terms of what this text says, those differences basically make no difference. Now... Mr. Didot's friend on one occasion said to me, Oh, the Christians are changing the Bible. It used to say in John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And today they've taken the word begotten out. And he would point that it's there in the King James and it's not there in the Revised Standard. And that's right, it's there in the King James and it's not there in the Revised Standard. Has someone changed the Bible? No, the word was never there in the Greek text, there's only one word in the Greek text, monogenes. And so the Bible's been changed? No, the English translation has been sharpened. No alteration of the words at all. Let me correct Dr. Douglas. The difference between version and translation. You see, the, the Christian scholars and missionaries are trying to confuse the Muslims with the term that version and translation means one and the same thing. It doesn't. You have the, in Christendom the Roman Catholic version of the Bible, the Douay or Reims version. 
that version has 73 books inside 73 books the one that the protestant world upholds is the king james version of the bible this version has 66 books seven books less now you see it's not just translation it is not a choice of words when the muslim says Translation, he means translation. Yusuf Ali, Daryabadi, uh, Muhammad Ali, uh, Maududi. Each and every one of these are translations. The difference is in the choice of words. Synonymous words, terms, different words are being used to translate a certain word according to the person's understanding or grasp of the language. That's a translation. But when seven books are thrown out of a book of God, those seven books, according to Brother Jimmy Swaggart, he said, he said, they are spurious, those seven books. These scholars say that they are apocrypha. I'm asking what is apocrypha? Apocrypha is a technical term for saying doubtful authority. In other words, it's not the word of God. So the Protestants say no. Then Dr. Douglas is a Protestant. He doesn't accept those seven books as the word of God. If you do, then you are a Roman Catholic. Then, he said the most accurate, we go to the Greek scriptures and the most accurate rendering of the scriptures is the RSV. That is what your scholars say. 32 scholars of the highest eminence in America, backed by 50 cooperating denominations, they produce the RSV, Revised Standard Version of the Bible. And they say beautiful thing about the King James Version, which every Christian takes an oath by, including Jimmy Swaggart. This is the book he uses. This is the book he sells. Now, they say, the revisers, that this book, the King James Version, has grave defects. And that these defects are so many and so serious as to call for revision. So they revised it. So they threw out, leave out the word begotten. You were going to the Greek scriptures. Hmm, I don't know Greek. But the Trinity, the Holy Trinity, the bedrock of Christendom, Christianity. Because what is the dispute? We say God is one, he say God is one. But they say that God is a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So we are at variance. We are at variance. Now that verse in the Trinity, the only place in this Bible, I don't know whether it is in his Bible, the Greek, he didn't say which version he's holding. But the bulk of Christendom, this is the one they have in their hands. And the verse is in first epistle of John, chapter 5, verse 7, where it says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And it is thrown out as a fabrication, out of the RSV, by your scholars. So that's a version. It's thrown out as a fabrication, adulteration. Then the ascension of Jesus, the only places in the Gospels where it occur is... Mark chapter 16, verse 19, that he ascended into heaven. Luke chapter 24, verse 51, that he ascended into heaven. They are also thrown out as fabrications. Now, that is version. You see, this is not saying that the translation. It's not translation, things that were supposed to be not there. They threw it out and honestly demands that you do. So that is the difference between a version and a translation. <laughs> Dr. Douglas. Do you believe the Old Testament to be the whole of the Word of God? If your answer is yes, do you say that Jesus was cursed because he was hanged to death? I'm sorry, let me repeat the question because I thought I misunderstood it. Do you believe in the Old Testament to be the whole Word of God? Yes, I believe the Old Testament to be the Word of God. I do not believe it to be the totality of the Word of God. But that, I, as I see the question, is, is not what's being asked. If your answer is yes, which it is, do you say that Jesus was cursed because he was hanged to death, as the Old Testament said? The New Testament definitely says Jesus was crucified or was hanged 
And from the perspective of the Jews, yes, he was cursed. He became a curse for you and me. In effect, taking the curse of sin and the punishment for sin upon himself. It's not that the Christian comes along and says a curse on Jesus. It says that the Christian says, or I as a Christian say, I better not speak for all Christians, I as a Christian say, Jesus bore the curse of my sin. The Jews treated Jesus as one they viewed as accursed or cursed, and they killed him because they felt he was false, he was not what they expected, but God in fact had in mind his death and his resurrection, and out of that curse, a blessing. Mr. Dieter, if Christ showed the disciples that he hadn't died, that he did not die, why would they go forth preaching he had died and maintain this story of their own martyrdoms? If Christ showed the disciples that he hadn't died, why would they go forth preaching that he had died? I do not read into the scripture that they started preaching. You know, his immediate disciples that Christ had died. What they were telling is that he's alive, that he's alive, that he's alive. And it was an anticlimax to the idea that they had that the man was killed on the cross. That was their experience because they were not eyewitnesses or your witnesses of the happening. So now comes Jesus and he demonstrates to them that he's there. He's the very same Jesus that was before eating broiled fish and honeycomb and going and traveling with them ever in hiding. So they said, no, the man is alive. We expected him to have died. He hadn't died. So that was the conviction that God saved him. And that is what they were preaching. This idea that he died for the sins of mankind, it doesn't seem to occur to me because this is against the law of God Almighty where he says the soul that sinneth it shall die. This is the law of God. That the one that sins, that, this, that is, that soul shall die. And the son shall not be the iniquity of the father. Meaning, whatever father Adam did, and mother Eve did, he says, the son will not be the iniquity, the sin of the father. Neither shall the son be the, the father, be, is the son be the iniquity of the father. He says, the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. This is the law of God, that whatever good thing the good man does, he gets his reward. And the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Whatever evil thing the evil man does, he gets punished for it. But if the wicked will turn from all the sins that he has committed and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. This is the law of God for all eternity. He does not take an innocent man to pay for the guilty. This is against his justice. Doctor was talking about the justice of God, the mercy of God. I said, what kind of mercy and justice is this that he can't punish the evil mongers? The sinners, so he takes his own son and he gets him crucified. Love, you call that love? Killing an innocent man, his own innocent son. Amazing, amazing type of reasoning, logic. The God of the Bible, as well as the Quran, the Bible says, Jesus, uh, in the book of Isaiah, said, I forgive sins for my own sake. And I will not rem remember your sins. In other words, once he forgives you, he's not asking you for blood of sheep or goat or lamb, nor of his son. But he says, I forgive sins for my own sake. And once I've forgiven, I don't remember it. It's all blotted out. This is the law of God in the Bible and the teaching of Jesus. Where Jesus Christ, he says, he says, he is not of me who does not take his cross and follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. In other words, the way I carry my responsibility, you carry yours. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Jesus says. Except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. There's no heaven for you, Jesus says to his disciples, unless you are better than the Jew. And I'm asking, how can you be better than the Jew by not keeping the laws and the commandments? Mr. Douglas, this one's for you. Christians claim that Jesus, peace be upon him, is God. 
My question is, did Jesus claim himself as the God? Did he say, I am God? Or did he ask his followers to worship me? One quick word to what uh, Dr. Dudat was saying a moment ago about the disciples going forth and preaching uh, Jesus' death. According to the record in the holy book, they did. Uh, ten days after he ascended into heaven, the Holy Spirit came, and the first time they preached, they said, Men of Israel, Jesus of Nazareth, a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, so on and so forth. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose. You, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross, but God raised him from the dead. The very next time that they were up to speak, you handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. So very quickly they were in fact preaching that. They were right or they wrong. They were deceived or, or uh, something very strange had, had, got on, had gone on. Did Jesus claim to be God? You mean in his very own words. If you're looking for the expression, I say that I am God. Just those words, you do not find it. But at the time of Jesus' trial, when he stood before the Jewish authorities, they said to him, tell us, are you the son of the blessed one? Who is the blessed one, Mary or God? And Jesus said, I am. And they said, what further need do we have for proof? He has blasphemed, let him die. Blasphemy is taking to a human being that which uniquely belongs to God. And nobody knew that any better than the Jews. No people in those days were any more sensitive to that. And so, yes, Jesus claimed to be God three times in the Gospel of John. He makes the statement, except you believe I am, you will die in your sins. Before Abraham was born, I am. They took up stones to stone him, for they understood full well what he was saying. Why did they react that way to that language? Because of the Old Testament in which God says, my name is I am, I am that I am. And so, yes, Jesus claimed to be God. Uh, did he ask his followers to worship him? If you mean, did he say to his followers, followers, fall down and worship me? No, you do not find those words coming from the lips of Jesus in the Gospels. But you do find people falling down and worshiping him. And he accepted it. He did not say, get up. He did not say you're mistaken. He did not say leave. He did not say that is inappropriate. He did not say you're wrong. He accepted it. To Ahmed Dida, you base your arguments on small points of the Bible. The same Bible which you believe is inaccurate to me this is a contradiction. Why do you do this? I do respect your religion, but this is a problem I can't understand. Mr. Chairman and brethren, you see, in every civilized nation on earth, people have disputes. And when these disputes go to court, the plaintiff, the complainant, he goes into the box into the witness box, and he testifies. He puts forth his claim. And the opposing advocate, attorney, he cross-examines the witness. When he's cross-examining the witness on the evidence that he has given, 
And on that evidence, if you can prove to the judge's satisfaction that the man is lying, lying, lying. If he feels satisfied that he has convinced the judge in his cross-examination that the witness was a liar. What he does is he closes the case and he asks for absolution with costs and he will get it. And this is normal practice in everyday affair. Dispute, you cross-examine the person and you come to a conclusion. Now the Holy Quran tells us to do the same. It says, وَقَالُوا And they say, who the Jews and the Christians, say, لَنْ يَدْخُلَ الْجَنَّةَ إِلَّا مَنْ كَانَا هُدًا أَوْ نَصَارًا That you Muslims will never, never enter Jannah. There's no heaven for you. There's no salvation for you. Except you become a Jew or except you become a Christian. In answer to that, God Almighty makes us to say, تِلْكَ أَمَانِيُّهُمْ That this is their wishful thinking, vain desires, hallucination. Pull, tell them, how to burhanakum. So produce your evidence. In Kuntum Sadiqin, if you are speaking the truth, let's have a look at your certificate that entitles it to heaven and destines us to hell. So they have produced it, the Bible, in 2,000 different languages. And he's saying, my Bible says this, my Bible says that. So we have to cross-examine the Bible, your witnesses. And we are proving from the mouth of your witnesses that the thing that you are alleging, what you are saying, you are claiming is not there. You see? Now you say, what about the other things which are true? I said, look, that is not at stake. If the Bible says that God is one, we say, we agree with you. He said, I quoted you from the Bible. He said, look, everyone is personally responsible for his or her action. I say, we agree with you. Can't you see? If you say, God is a loving father in heaven, I said, right, we agree with you. But when you say that he's like Shylock, wanting to get a pound of flesh from his creation, Adam and Eve sins and he makes you responsible, and at the beginning of 1986, there were 4.8 billion people on earth. And according to the Christian belief that everyone goes to hell for what? The sin that Adam and Eve committed. So I said, this is the most nonsensical idea. Because Adam didn't ask me before eating the apple, nor did Eve ask my wife. How can God hold us responsible? Mr. Douglas. Matthew, the 12th chapter, and the 40th verse says, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be uh, in three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. I am a Christian of the Church of Christ. I am confused. Please explain to me how Jesus could be in the earth three days and three nights. Well, first of all, let me say I'll be delighted to talk with you about this at a more, in a more extended way than, than uh, our time now permits. The thing that I think you must realize is the thing that I tried to say earlier when I alluded to this passage. If one is going to take three days and three nights in the heart of the earth and... Uh, insist upon absolute literalism. Are we talking about uh, 72 hours? Now, what are we talking about? Three days and three nights. Or are we talking about an approximation of time, as I mentioned? Uh, when I report to people that I see along the way, they'll say, where have you been? I said, in Lawrence, Kansas. How long you were there? How long were you there? I was there two days. Well, I have not been in Lawrence and will not be in Lawrence 48 hours. The writers of the New Testament were writing for a variety of different audiences who counted time differently. And if you will look at the computation of time with reference to the death of Jesus in John's Gospel, with, in comparison to the computation of time with reference to the death of Jesus in the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you will find a difference. A difference simply in the way they described time. For, as Mr. Didot has said, the Jews, the day begins at sundown and moves on. The Romans did not think that way. And so you find some writers dealing in Roman time. You find other writers dealing in more of what you would think of as Semitic or Hebraic time. And the difference there is a very understandable thing. It's a question of reporting. 
If any of you who are Americans have been in the military, and I said to you, now, what time is it? You would report it's 2200. And others of you would think, what in the world is he saying? Why, it's 10 o'clock. The same time, different descriptions. This would be Mr. Didat's last question. Mr. Didat, in the book of Re Revelation, Jesus claims that I am the first and the last. And also he said, I am Alpha and Omega, and the beginning and the end. If Christ was not God, how could he make such a claim? The book of Revelation, scholars will tell you, was a dream of John. It was a dream which he has put down on paper. These are what people hear, if at all, that if Jesus appeared to him, to John, and told him, I am Alpha and Omega, if he did, which I do not believe, that is talking about God Almighty, that God is saying, I am Alpha and Omega. I am the first and the last, not Jesus. But suppose you put these words into the mouth of Jesus, according to your translations. Even then, a dream. You know, a people, when they eat a bit too much, it happens you dream dreams, things that you see. And you read this book of Revelation, describing to you certain beasts with eyes outside and eyes inside, and you know, something which absolutely you have eaten too much, you start thinking in those terms. So, I said, now, while Jesus walked this earth, we have to now understand that while he walked this earth, in none of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, is the expression ever used, I am God, or worship me. On the contrary, he says, my father is greater than I. He says, my father is greater than all. He says, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is righteous, because I seek not my own will, but the will of him that sent me. He says, of that day knoweth no man, no, not the angels, nor the Son, but the Father in heaven. In my knowledge I am not like God. In my power I am not like God. He says, all power is given unto me, it is not mine. I by the finger of God cast out devils. I by the Spirit of God do these things. Where does he say that he is doing the works? That it is his power, he is doing it, nowhere. And Peter testified in the quotation that uh, the doctor gave. Peter in the book of Acts testifies. He says, ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you. A man, not God approved among you. A man. He quoted it, but of course the quotation went off such like water and ducks back. You people hardly apprehended anything. He says, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him. He didn't do it, which God did by him in the midst of you, which you also know. I said, look, we agree with that. The Quran testifies to that effect that he gave life to the dead by God's permission. He healed those blind and the lepers by God's permission. We agree with that. But I said, look, now your interpretation, your reading, you are reading into your own scripture something that is not there and which is contrary to what Jesus claimed. He's teaching us his come. I'll teach you how to pray. It's a pray like this. So, oh, our Father which art in heaven. Our Father, yours and mine, including Judas. Not the Father of Jesus Christ in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Singular. Thy name. Thy will be done. Thy, as, as, in, as it is on earth, as it is in heaven. Where does he say I'm God? Where does he say worship me? Nowhere. Nowhere. It is something now, like I just heard on TV, the program of Brother Jimmy Swaggart. Uh, he's giving some lessons on TV, and at the end of that lesson on Babylon, one of his panel members, he says, you know, I've been to Mongolia. i just been to Mongolia, and there, he said, I went to a Buddhist temple, and there, the supervisor, while he was with me, I'm asking him that this wheel, prayer wheel, on which you people are pinning in your prayers, in written form, and you turn the wheel, what for? He says, no, this is now, we are asking in this form, asking Buddha for help. But he said, look, I read so many books on Buddha, nowhere does Buddha claim to be God. Nowhere. 
This is one of our panel members of Jimmy Swaggart says, no one says that Jesus, that Buddha is God. He says, nowhere. He says, yes, that is true, but we say he is God. We make him God. This is the same. What he is talking, laughing at the Buddhist, I said, my brother, you are in the same boat. You are doing the very same thing. Brothers and sisters, I want you to acknowledge really these two fine champions, two wonderful gentlemen for sharing their valuable time and the energies with us tonight. However you want to acknowledge them. Thank you very much.